So I'm going to be reading you a selection from James Baldwin's Just From Just Above My Head, 1979. And this is from an anthology um, that was edited by Ethan Harris. You know that he wrote um, some very interesting, very interesting line of very Terry McMillan-esque sort of download uh, books. Um, Ethan Harris says, All That We Lost Him last year, or was it this year, or yeah, this summer? So this book is called Freedom in My Village, 25 Years of Black Gay Men's Writing. And I love this James Baldwin, so from just above my head. I haven't known Jimmy all of my life, but I've known him all of his. A curious difference as time goes on. I hardly ever noticed him until I started going with Julia. Until then, he'd just been Julia's snot-nosed, noisy little brother, an absolute drag, and every once in a while, I have to step over him politely, or push him aside politely, or indicate politely that he go fuck himself. I had nothing against him, I just didn't need him. While I was going with Julia, I remember him mainly coming in the door or going out of it. He no longer lived at home, but then, just the same, he, came more, he became more real to me. I knew how much he meant to Julia. Julia and I were going together in 1957, the year that Arthur went solo. Julia and I, for reasons that I will have to go into later, didn't last too long, but Arthur Solo did. So, in 1960 or thereabouts, Arthur was doing a civil rights benefit in a church in the backwoods of Florida, and his regular pianist was in jail in Alabama. I went in with Arthur on his trip because I had become a little frightened for him, perhaps also because, without quite admitting it, I was becoming more involved myself. I had a whole lot of reservations about nonviolent protest and praying for your enemies and freedom songs and all that. But those white crackers were far from nonviolent. You could hear the blows and the screams and the prayers from Mississippi to Harlem. You could catch it on your TV set when you came home. There was no way for some people to act like you didn't know. I say, some people. And I say it with great bitterness and even hatred in my heart for, God knows, some people were not most people. Most Americans do not give a shit about those black boys and girls and men and women and some white boys and girls and white men and women being beaten and murdered in their name. Most Americans proved themselves to be absolute cowards. That's the truth. And the record bears me out, but I'm running ahead of myself. Some of the kids drove us to the church because Arthur was determined, and we found Jimmy there. Jimmy had been working in the South for about two years. Now, Julia had told me this, and I also knew that Jimmy played piano. But none of this registered until that moment Arthur and I walked into the church and found Jimmy sitting there. He was sitting in the kitchen which was in the church basement. This basement had already been bombed twice. There were sandbags in one corner and in the hole where one of the windows had been. Jimmy was sitting on the kitchen table, chewing on a bacon sandwich, chewing on, chewing on a bacon sandwich, <laughs> wearing a torn green sweater, blue jeans, and sneakers. He was very thin. I didn't recognize him right away, but Arthur did. Jimmy grinned and said, Welcome to the slaughter, children. And don't go nowhere without your comb, your wash rag, and your toothbrush. Some of these jails have running water. Then he said to Arthur, I hear your main man's been detained in the cradle of the Confederacy. I'll play for you if you want. Beautiful, Arthur said. You want to run through a couple with me right quick? Just so we'll get a sense of each other. 
Jimmy stood up and finished his sandwich. His sandwich. At your service, he said, and we walked upstairs into the church. Jimmy sat down at the piano. A couple of kids gathered round. Two black men stood at the doors watching the street. It was about two hours before the church service, which was really a protest rally, would begin. Arthur's name hung in banners outside the church. The air was heavy with the tension I was eventually to come to know as well as I know my own name. Jimmy began to play. Arthur waited a little, then he began to sing. He and Jimmy grinned at each other briefly as each began to enter each of the other's beat. A few more kids gathered, gathered round the altar. A couple of women, arms folded, stood in the aisle. A telephone rang in the church office. Someone immediately picked it up, closing the office door. I joined the two men as the music began to come alive and stood at the door with them, staring out at the pastoral um, apocalyptic streets. More than a year later, one rainy night in Harlem, we let, <clears throat> we let the rain... We let the rain sort of float, up, float us from one bar to another, and we walked and talked alone on the black and silver streets surrounded by the rain, water dropping from our hair and eyelashes from the tips of our noses and down our backs. Arthur had just come in from London. No one knows very much about the life of, a, of another. This ignorance becomes vivid if you love another. Love sets the imagination on fire and also, eventually, charges the imagination into a harder element. Imagination cannot match love, cannot plunge so deep or range so wide. Ruth was in the hospital with Tony then, and Arthur and I had had dinner alone. It was raining as we walked out of the restaurant, which was near the Renaissance Theater on 7th Avenue. My apartment and one of those damn disastrous housing projects was behind us, slightly to the east. Arthur had been very silent during the dinner. I watched his face. It was a face I knew and didn't know. He had something on his mind. We walked out silently and found the rain, but we did not start back toward my apartment. We started slowly down the long, long avenue, long with silence, loud with rain. Cars rocked. Proudly, amphibious, throwing up buckets of water. People stood in vestibules, in little circles of light, hugged the walls of buildings, splashed furiously through puddles, who walked very slowly. I was wearing a cap. Arthur was bareheaded, holding a folded newspaper on top of his head. Arthur stopped before Dickie Wells. We looked briefly at each other and walked in and sat down at the bar. It was early, that is. It is not yet midnight, and the place was quiet. The bartender served us, and Arthur looked down into his glass, and then he looked up at me, and he said, So, we're finally going to work together. We had decided that just before he'd gone to London. It was Arthur who insisted. I worked in the advertising department of a black magazine. At least it said it was black. And the job wasn't bad, but Arthur said that he was turning me into a schizo, and I could see that that might be true. Arthur was around 26, which means that we had edged into the 60s. Without having yet, as the proverb goes, made it, Arthur was a tremendous drawing card, absolutely individual, and had reached that curious point through which all memorable careers seemed to pass when you must either go up and over or down and out. We were due to sign for this first record album in a matter of days, and this, too, was very much on his mind. Are you having second thoughts about us working together? He grinned. You can't go out of it that way, baby. You can't get out of it that way, baby. Then again, he was silent, and I watched his face. When you sing, he said, suddenly, you can't sing outside the song. You've got to be the song you sing. You've got to make a confession. And I'll end there. I like James Bond. I like him. He's like an anthropologist. He's bossy.